Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Chris DeFay, and uh, I'm a member of the Talks at Google program. Uh, we're very proud to introduce Tom LaTourette. Uh, he is a senior physical scientist at RAND, uh, our neighbors just down the street. And he specializes in energy, public policy, and homeland security policy. And he's here today to talk about nuclear power in a post-Fukushima world. I'll give the floor to Tom. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to cover a lot of ground, so pardon me if I look down at my notes once in a while. Um, but I want, to, I want to talk about a lot of different aspects of nuclear power. It's a very general presentation. It will include some of the results of some of the work we've done, but it's going to go well beyond that. Um, and uh, you're welcome to ask questions. I'll, I should have plenty of time at the end for questions as well. Uh, so nuclear power, it accounts for about 14% of our electricity consumed here in California about 20% uh, in the United States, and then 14% worldwide. Um, the bulk of the remainder around the world is coal, natural gas, um, hydropower, and a few percent from petroleum and renewables. Um, each of these sources has strengths and weaknesses. But among them, nuclear stands out as probably being subject to the most ambivalence. Um, and you, we see this ambivalence manifest in, in really the wide range of attitudes about nuclear power around the world, ranging from uh, complete intolerance uh, to ardent support and growth. And so, as is the nature of ambivalence, uh, it varies from place to place and time to time. And certainly, one of the things that strongly affects our attitudes about nuclear power is major accidents, um, of which there have been really just three. Three Mile Island, um, Chernobyl, and then just over a year ago, Fukushima. And so, just a little more than a year after the Fukushima accident, it seems like a good time to sort of examine the status of nuclear power and where it might be headed. So today I'm going to explore several of the so, characteristics of nuclear power. Uh, I'll explore some of the, the, the various characteristics, both favorable and worrisome, about nuclear power. And I'll spend a little more time on one in particular, that is uh, waste management, what to do with the, the spent nuclear fuel. There's a variety of reasons I'll, I'll get to why that's of particular interest right now. And then I'll finish up by discussing what's happened around the world and in the United States in the aftermath of Fukushima and what that might mean for nuclear power going forward. So among the considerations about nuclear power, I'll start out with probably the most worrisome one, nuclear proliferation. Right, the fact that nuclear power is born essentially as a spin-off of nuclear weapons looms pretty large in most people's perceptions of, of nuclear power. Um, for all the, uh, uh, the problems with coal or natural gas, no one's ever been annihilated with them. So this is a very, in, the, the threat of nuclear weapons and nuclear proliferation is a very real and very serious concern. And the way we deal with this is with the, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And this is a very complicated issue that I don't have time to go into. Um, uh, but it basically consists of a series of, of safeguards and rules that uh, are intended to prevent countries with nuclear power making the jump to nuclear energy. And I'll just point out one interesting fact about this, about this risk. Uh, it turns out that having a nuclear power plant itself is of very little interest or, or value if you want to make nuclear weapons. There's not much you can do with a nuclear power plant. The real, the real threat or the real score for somebody who wants to make nuclear weapons is the enrichment plant where you make the fuel for nuclear power. And that's because both the fuel for nuclear reactors and bombs both require specialized uh, techniques and materials to enrich uranium in its uh, isotope, uranium-235, the fissionable isotope. So although there's a lot of different things we do to, to help limit the spread of nuclear weapons, one thing you, we could do, which isn't really always acceptable, but some countries do, is that is um, limit the ability to enrich fuel. So you can have a nuclear power plant, but limit the ability to enrich fuel to a few trusted uh, states, and they can supply fuel to anybody who wants to buy it. And that way, any country can have nuclear power, but without, posing, without having the enrichment capabilities and without posing the risk of making the jump to nuclear weapons. Um, another uh, very interesting and, and important aspect of nuclear power is cost. When it was first being developed, we were told that it would be too cheap to meter. Um, I, I don't know if any of you have ever heard this. This was the, the mantra at the time, too cheap to meter. Well, of course, it hasn't turned out to be that way. 
Um, although it's, it's not obvious why. Strictly speaking, when you look at running a nuclear power plant and fueling it, it is the cheapest way to make electricity. It's incredibly cheap. But what those early estimates didn't account for was the fact that it's very expensive to build a nuclear power plant. Uh, the infrastructure involved in putting together a nuclear power plant is, is quite involved, and that adds a lot of the cost. And so when you do what's known as a levelized cost analysis, which allows you to compare apples to apples, you include the, the, the cost of building the infrastructure, of financing, running the plant, fueling the plant, disposing of the waste, decommissioning the plant, then uh, nuclear does come out to be uh, more expensive than natural gas and much more expensive than coal. Um, but hold that thought. I'll return to cost in just a minute. Um, and, and it starts to look a little bit better. Another concern related to nuclear power is health and safety risk. And this stems primarily from the, the risk of a release of radioactivity from an accident uh, at a nuclear power plant. There have been, in the history of nuclear power, around 50 confirmed deaths related to radiation from a nuclear power plant accident, all of those at Chernobyl. Um, of course, there are many, many more deaths expected from Chernobyl from latent cancers that are expected to turn up, or have been turning up, and expected to continue to turn up over the long term. And estimates, credible estimates for that range in the neighborhood of 5,000 to 10,000. Um, by comparison, in the case of Fukushima, there were two confirmed deaths, neither of which were related to radiation. Those were blunt force trauma. And uh, similarly, there are expected to be some long-term cancer deaths. No one really has any good estimates right now, but they range from very low uh, to possibly as high as uh, a tenth of Chernobyl, so maybe up to 1,000. Um, but of course, it's way too early to say with any confidence. So these numbers are not trivial. Um, but is, as with everything in energy, it's useful to compare it to alternatives. And when you look at coal, for example, there are at least 5,000 deaths from coal mining accidents around the world every year. So we're talking about well over an order of magnitude greater safety and health risk just from coal. And that is by far the number one electricity source around the world. Um, so, so, and this doesn't even account for, for the other kinds of, of health issues, mostly respiratory related, coming from both coal mining as well as just breathing coal-fired power plant emissions. So the difference is pretty big, but of course people, people view different risks differently. Um, even though the outcome we expect over the long term is that nuclear is in fact far safer than coal, the outcome of a single, a worst case scenario for a single incident, nuclear can be far, far less safe than coal. And so it's this sort of dichotomy of different types of risks that really is part of what feeds into the ambivalence about nuclear power. And it's, it's really hard to compare those two risks. Um, one of the great advantages of nuclear power, of course, is that it produces very few greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, as, uh, running the plant itself basically produces none. Um, Essentially, all the emissions have to do with building the plant and, and partly also enriching the fuel. And when you do what's known as a life cycle analysis, which is analogous to the, the levelized cost analysis, it, it, it accounts for the emissions from building the plant, running the plant, fueling the plant, decommissioning, waste disposal, and all of that. Nuclear, compared to all the other electricity sources, comes out right at the bottom, right there with, with wind and hydropower. It's having the lowest greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so there's a couple of ways we can appreciate this difference. One is, again, to compare to other sources. We often hear about clean burning natural gas because it emits about half the greenhouse gas emissions of coal. Um, well, the factor of two is important, but that's really quite a different thing compared to the fact that nuclear has about 50 times less greenhouse gas emissions than coal. So it's really an entirely different realm in terms of climate change and, and solutions to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Another way to appreciate the greenhouse gas emis emissions of nuclear is to return to this question of cost. I said these, these levelized cost analyses try to take into account all the costs so that you can truly compare apples to apples. But one of the costs they don't include is what we call the social cost of climate change. That is the cost of CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions. And the reason they don't include those costs is because we don't really, we as a so society don't really have a good handle on what those, car those costs are yet. So they're just beginning to enter sort of scientific estimates, and they're, they're nowhere in, in the market, really, in the market prices. 
But as we learn more, it seems inevitable that they will start to enter the marketplace and they will change the cost of things. And when, when we start to include the cost of greenhouse gas emissions, then nuclear will be uh, probably much more competitive um, than coal or natural gas. And then the final aspect of nuclear power I want to discuss is, as I said, waste management. Amidst all the controversy and ambivalence about nuclear power, probably the single aspect that contributes most to this controversy and ambivalence is what to do with the nuclear waste, the spent fuel. Um, just so very briefly, I want to just explain what is nuclear fuel and spent fuel. So fuel for most commercial nuclear power plants around the world consists of little thimble-sized uranium oxide pellets. And you take a few hundred of these and stack them up into very, very long, thin tubes, about four meters long. You take about 250 of these tubes and you cluster them together in what's known as a fuel assembly. And this is sort of the fuel unit for nuclear power plants. And a typical nuclear power plant will use 100 to maybe 300 of these fuel assemblies in its core at any one time. And, and you change out portions of it over time. When it's new, it's not very radioactive, and it's pretty safe to handle. And you'll see there's a person holding, you see people handling it. The, but however, once it gets into the reactor and the uranium starts fissioning or splitting into a whole slew of so-called daughter products, these daughter products are very, some of them are very radioactive and very dangerous. And the real dilemma arises from the fact that some of those dangerous daughter products remain radioactive for a long, long time. Um, so you can't just dump this stuff into a landfill when you're done with it. You have to actually isolate it from human contact for uh, tens or even hundreds of thousands of years. So, so therein lies the rub. Um, we recognized early on that you know, human institutions really couldn't be relied upon to manage something, spent fuel or anything for that matter, for those kinds of time scales. And so really, uh, it was early on recognized that the only feasible solution is to bury the spent fuel deep underground in such a way that it isolates the waste from human contact for the, the amount of time we need. So since the very beginning, it's been a virtual certainty that we would need what's known as a permanent geological repository. And this is just a schematic drawing of one. It's showing the surface of the Earth and then a cutaway of underground. And uh, conceptually, this is very simple. It's, it's just mine shafts and tunnels underground. Um, you package up the spent fuel, you put it down there, you backfill it, you seal it up, and you walk away. And if you've designed it right, uh, it doesn't, doesn't interact with the biosphere for the amount of time you need, uh, need it to not react. Um, despite knowing we would need something like this, literally for decades, since the very beginning, no one, no country has ever uh, developed a permanent geological repository. So what that means is that essentially all of the fuel from nuclear power production in the world that's ever been produced is still in temporary storage. In the U.S., um, virtually all of that is still at the nuclear power plants where it was originally produced. It's essentially in the backyards of these nuclear reactors. Um, and you know, part of the difficulty and why we haven't ever produced one of these things is because we've really continually underappreciated the, both the technical and, and equally importantly the social political challenges of developing something like this. While conceptually it may be simple, the devil's in the details. And uh, not that we haven't tried. Uh, I don't have time to go into the history, but many of you may know we've just finished watching a very carefully crafted plan in this country for a, a, a spent fuel underground repository at Yucca Mountain, Nevada, completely unravel. All right, that plan was 30 years in the making, was very careful. Um, it's recently been, at a minimum, mothballed and probably completely scrapped. So we're back to square one. We don't have a plan. Um, and we need to come up with one. Well, so if we agree that we do need to have nuclear waste in a permanent geological repository, and yet we don't have one, clearly temporary storage is, a, is an unsustainable position. Um, but you, know, you could argue that, well, we'll get to it when we get to it. It's OK. It's working fine. But in fact, there are some, some more pressing reasons why we might want to make a change sooner rather than later. And I'll go through three of them. Um, I think together they're pretty compelling, although you can poke holes in any one of them. Taken together, they do make a pretty compelling case. The first is nuclear power plants are running out of room to store this spent fuel. Some of them have been running since the late 60s. Um, 
That's a lot of spent fuel piling up. Um, what we do with spent fuel at a nuclear reactor, they all have what's known as a spent fuel pool. This is a pool of water that's part of the reactor design, and it's there to uh, move fuel around during refueling and maintenance and other things. It's designed for temporary storage of the spent fuel after you take it out until you ship it off to a repository. Well, of course, as the repository repeated to not appear, um, these pools became de facto long-term storage facilities, something for which they were never designed. Um, and so they started to get full. And so the first thing people did is re-rack them. That is, is they take, took out the racks that were in there and put in a new kind of rack that increases the density to four to five times as dense as they were originally designed. Um, so there's a lot more spent fuel in these pools. But even then, they're starting to fill up. Um, so the next thing we did was develop what's known as dry cask storage. And this is taking the spent fuel out of the pools, putting it in these enormous uh, metal and concrete canisters, and setting them out on a, on a concrete pad or sometimes in a concrete vault, again, at the site of the reactor, just, just outside. Um, this works pretty well. We have about a quarter of the spent fuel in the country is in these right now, and three quarters is in the pools. Um, but even this is not good enough for many cases where there's just not room for something like this, or, or more poignantly, some places where we have what's known as stranded fuel. And stranded fuel is fuel in dry cast storage like this at a site where the reactor has been decommissioned, and in many places dismantled and gone, and the only thing left is the spent fuel. And yet, it's still there, we can't get rid of it, and its presence prevents redevelopment of the site. Um, so there's a real urgency there to get rid of it. So we're running out of space. A second reason we might want to move sooner rather than later on spent fuel is you often hear an ethical argument that says, you know, we can't leave this stuff for future generations to deal with it. We have a responsibility to deal with it ourselves. That's uh, uh, certainly a very valid argument. I, I agree with it. And yet it, it needs to be tempered with a couple of observations. First is we've already passed this on to the next generation. I mean, it's been around. This is nuclear power is my parents' generation. I wasn't even born when it got started. So it has been passed on. That horse is out of the barn. That doesn't necessarily make it OK, but it does demonstrate that it's possible. Um, and, and, and we're still here. The second sort of caveat to this argument is, is the equivalent of the carpenter's motto, measure twice and cut once. And that meaning dealing with nuclear power is, is or nuclear, spent nuclear fuel is tricky. It's, it's dangerous stuff. It's a serious problem. You want to do it right. And if that means waiting until we're really sure we've got a good solution and we're able to do so, then, then perhaps it is OK to wait a little while until we're sure we've got a good solution. Um, then the third, um, the third argument that we might want to move sooner rather than later stems from the, the safety risk uh, associated with packing all this spent fuel into these pools. Um, we saw this highlighted at Fukushima. Um, this is, we've all heard about core meltdowns, and that happened at Fukushima as well. But a lesser known risk, and yet not unknown, is, the, is the, the risk of spent fuel in these pools. Um, and, and Fukushima is the first case I'm aware of where there might have been damage to, spent, to, to nuclear fuel that wasn't in the reactor core at the time. And, and I'll just explain how this risk goes. It's, it's a potential risk. Um, nuclear fuel is, as I said, very radioactive. And that means when you take it out of the reactor, it's thermally very, very hot. So you need electricity to cool these spent fuel pools. Uh, if not, the pool heats up, the water starts to evaporate, the, the, the spent fuel is exposed to air, at which point um, the reaction between the cladding and the hydrogen and just the, the heat can cause what's paradoxically known as a pool fire. And at this point, the, the, the spent fuel will catch fire. And at this point, you can, as you can imagine, you can have really tremendous releases of radionuclides in a fire plume spreading out past the reactor. Um, and, and as I, sh I should add, often, as in the case of Fukushima, there's a lot more spent fuel in these spent fuel pools than there is in the core itself. Um, so it's a potentially very dangerous situation. Now, I say potentially because we still don't, even 14 months later, know exactly what happened with the spent fuel pools in Fukushima. We do know they lost power. Um, the earthquake knocked out, well, caused the reactor itself to shut down. It also knocked out the grid power, so there was no electricity. 
They have backup generators. Those came on as designed. 40 minutes later, we all know those were wiped out by the tsunami. And then there's backup, backup batteries that came on as designed and lasted for a few hours as designed. And then they ran out. And at that point, there was no power. The water started to heat up. Uh, we also know that there was a, an explosion that blew the walls and the roof off the, the spent fuel pool building. We don't know if the explosion was caused by the spent fuel or some other source. You may remember there were a lot of initial reports that said, yeah, there was spent fuel caught fire, the pools drained. Subsequent analyses and, and videos seem to indicate that that actually didn't happen, that the pools didn't drain. And there, there appears to be, again, uncertain, but may have been no damage to the spent fuel. But in any case, it was at least a very close call. I think we can all agree on that. So these arguments combined together say we really probably do need to move on managing spent fuel sooner rather than later. It doesn't necessarily mean it's an emergency and we've got to get this stuff underground as quickly as possible. But it does mean we really do need to have, develop a plan, an acceptable plan for, for, the, for the completion, the long-term management and disposal of spent nuclear fuel. So a couple of years ago, a group of us here at RAND undertook a study to look at different options and try and see if one could decide how to, how to choose among them for how to manage spent fuel, given that the plan we had was failing and, and being uh, abandoned by the, by the government. Um, so we looked at four strategies. And these strategies, as we've defined them, pretty much span the entire range of feasible options for dealing with spent fuel. The first is uh, to reactivate the Yucca Mountain repository that was recently abandoned. The, the motivation, that, at least the, the, ar the argument, not, not necessarily my argument, but the argument in support of this says that you know, the site is good. We've done a lot of work, invested a tremendous amount of time, money, effort uh, in designing this site and getting everything ready. And it would be a shame and a great waste to just walk away from it. A second alternative would be to uh, abandon Yucca Mountain and find a new site for a permanent geological repository. Um, and in the meantime, take all the spent fuel from all the reactors and move it to a centralized surface storage facility, some sort of consolidated storage facility, like a spent fuel farm. Um, and the rationale here would be that the Yucca Mountain site is not OK. We don't want to proceed with that. We can do better. Um, but that's going to take time. So finding a new site, characterizing it, choosing it, and saying, OK, that's going to take decades. In the meantime, we need to do something to demonstrate progress towards, towards moving the spent fuel. So the idea would be to get it off, to have the government take possession of it, get it off the utility sites, and, and consolidate it, and get it ready to put underground. Um, a third option is, is recycling. And I, this picture doesn't really do it justice. But essentially, the, the message is, even at the end of the cycle, when we take the spent fuel out of the reactor, there's still a tremendous amount of energy potential. There's, it's still 95% uranium. There's a tremendous energy resource there that could be tapped and, um, and recycled and used in new fuel. Um, and in some future scenarios of, of, of design, it's possible that you could also decrease the amount of space you need in a permanent geological repository. You're always going to have some waste, no matter what you recycle. There's always some waste. And that waste is very, very radioactive. But you could design this in certain ways where you wouldn't need quite as much space. And then the fourth option is uh, wait and see. Do what we're doing now. Just keep moving it out of the pools into the dry storage casks. And the motivation for this is there's too much uncertainty with any of these other options. We just It's too risky to move now. We're going to wait until we have better knowledge, better technology, better ideas, something like that. Um, so we looked at these four options in the context of, of costs and safety, security, technical feasibility, and public acceptance. And it turns out that given all the uncertainty and lack of experience, there's really, it's hard to make a compelling case for one option over another. Um, but one of the ways you can distinguish these options is in terms of how they address priorities we may have about nuclear power. And these are priorities you often hear in de debates about nuclear power, like we need to solve the, the nuclear waste issue right away. Or we need to pave the way for new nuclear power plants. And right now, the fact that we can't get rid of the spent fuel is really a problem for that. Or 
you know, we can't trust the government, we don't trust Yucca Mountain, we don't think they've done it right, we need to build a stronger sense of confidence and consensus in the decision-making process. Things like that. And for each priori priority, we asked which, which of these strategies is most consistent with that priority. Uh, and the idea being that if we have a, a common sense of priorities, that will help guide us in terms of what, what option we want to pursue for managing spent fuel. Um, and when we looked at it this way, we can start to distinguish the different strategies. And based on uh, at least current thinking and preferences, one strategy does seem to emerge as being more preferable than the others. And that's the one in, in the upper right. That is, abandon Yucca Mountain, restart the site selection process for a new repository. But in the meantime, have the government make good on its promise, take possession of the spent fuel, collect it all in a consolidated storage site. That can happen quite quickly. Um, building one of those is, in theory, pretty simple. Um, and so that demonstrates good progress, undoes a lot of log jams, and in the meantime, allows you time and flexibility to really pick a site that everyone can agree on and develop a process that everyone is, is happy with uh, to come up with a, a permanent geological repository that everyone can get behind. Um, I just want to finish my discussion of spent fuel by noting that at the same time we were doing our study, uh, the President directed the Secretary of Energy to convene what's known as a Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future. And the, this was a team of people charged with, with uh, charting out a new course for managing spent fuel now that the existing policy has been all but abandoned. Um, they covered a lot more, and their, their report just came out a couple of months ago. Um, their report covered a lot more ground than ours, but where they did overlap, uh, the results are actually quite consistent with ours. They, they pretty much went for that same, same recommendation. Uh, uh, yeah. Are you waiting for questions for the end? Um, go ahead. Oh, okay. I was just, um, how much of, uh, it seems to me that, uh, in this, I don't you probably have more information, but it seems to me that the primary reason Yucca Mountain was abandoned was kind of a nimbyism. And, I, do you think that, you know, if we were to try to choose a new site that we would ever overcome, uh, you know, do you ever think that the local people would be okay with it anywhere? And, and that same goes for, like, if you have a temporary storage facility, I mean, I, I would imagine there would be the same resistance from anybody nearby. Like, no, don't bring that nuclear fuel here, even if it's temporarily. Right. That's a, that's a very valid and very real concern, and I, I can't answer it if it'll work, but uh, the, the problem with Yucca Mountain was, was multidimensional, and NIMBYism, even by itself, was not quite what it was. It was the state really fought it, and the locals, they were actually able to get behind it, and that's happened in the past in different instances of citing things. It's often the state that's really the, the impediment. In any case, the process by which Yucca Mountain was chosen and investigated was entirely flawed. There's no, there's no uh, disagreement about that. And there's a tremendous amount of effort going on right now, and we're working on this as well, with the Department of Energy to build a new type of organization and a new type of process that engages the states and locals. The way it was set up the first time, and that was set up in 1982, it was federal decision makers made all the calls. They, rule, they ruled everything. States and locals had, you know, trivial sort of uh, amount of power in decision making in the process. And that's clearly a mistake. Uh, and that's got to change. But there was other issues. The site itself is not the best. Um, there are serious, honest to goodness, technical issues with the site that took a lot of time and energy to overcome. And I think, you know, the process of doing that sort of eked away, and the time it took to do that eked away at people's confidence. And the regulatory environment, there were mistakes, bad mistakes made there between the EPA and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that I think won't happen again. Um, so there is an opportunity to do a much better job. Um, whether it will work remains to be seen. I, you're, you're sort of, you're, you're getting ahead of, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so, so we have a plan that's probably gonna be recommended in, in the coming months. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's right or it's going to work. Um, there's a couple things we know about nuclear waste disposal. One is nothing is ever completely new. Everything up here you've, I've showed you has been discussed in some form or another many times in the past. 
uh, and it ain't over until it's over. No matter how beautiful the plan may look at the beginning, I mean, in 1982, they were, or 87, they were toasting, they were happy, this is, we did it, you know, we worked so hard. Well, look where we are now. So, uh, you know, there, there is a sense of deja vu all over again. We've had commissions, we've had studies, we've had working groups. Um, the one advantage we have now is we got pretty far along with the process we know doesn't work. So hopefully we can leverage that experience and to develop something, something that will. I'll just finish up by talking about um, some of the things that have happened in the aftermath of the Fukushima accident around the world um, and in the United States. And perhaps the biggest response to Fukushima is that several countries have opted to eliminate, slow down, or stay out of nuclear power. Um, Germany, Belgium, and Switzerland, all uh, soon after the Fukushima accident, made official decisions to phase out nuclear, uh, nuclear power, 100% out in the next 10 to 20 years. And in fact, G Germany, in, in the months after Fukushima, actually has shut down half its nuclear power plants. Um, while this is a pretty significant change, particularly in the case of Germany, it's not as profound as it may f at first appear. And, and that, by that, I mean that they had already made the decision to get out of nuclear power. Germany and Belgium already had laws on the books phasing out nuclear power. And in fact, they had made special efforts to put those laws on hold when confronted with the alternative. Greenhouse gas emissions from coal, cost. Uh, it's really you know, just the effort of building a bunch of new plants. It's a, it's a pretty Im imposing thing to face. So they put those laws on hold. And so really, the, the, the decision after Fukushima was not to cancel nuclear power as much as it was to return to the previous position that we don't want nuclear power. Um, also, not terribly surprisingly, Italy voted again to not get involved in nuclear power. Uh, Venezuela chose not to get involved in nuclear power. I, one doubts they voted, but uh, there was a decision. They were considering getting into nuclear power. They put the brakes on that. Uh, perhaps more meaningful is Japan itself. Um, they have made mention, or, or more than mention, they've, they've sort of said they're going to phase out nuclear power over the next 40 years. And that's pretty significant because they were at 30% nuclear before Fukushima. They had already put into place big plans to ramp that up to over 50%. And so a decision to, to instead go down to zero is really quite significant. Um, and if they stick with that, that's by far the biggest uh, fallout from Fukushima. Yes? They're at zero now, right? They're, uh, yeah. It, it may be one running, but I think that was a few days ago the last one went down. So the, the way it works is they shut down several for risks, and then they implemented a policy that when a reactor shut down for um, routine maintenance, there are very special criteria by which you can start it up again that require local consent, and nobody's giving that consent right now. So every time one shuts down, for maintenance, it's pretty much staying down. So now they're, they're at zero. Um, another significant response is that China, which is in the middle of a nuclear construction frenzy, and they're really building a lot of nuclear power, um, has sort of put on the brakes on that. Not completely. They're scaling back their, their capacity targets for 2020 by, I, th I think, around 10 to 20 percent. But they're still building a tremendous amount of nuclear power capacity. Uh, perhaps equally meaningful is several major nuclear countries, the UK, France, the US, England, uh, uh, Ukraine, Russia, Canada, have made no mention, uh, South Korea, no mention of, of changing their plans for nuclear power um, in response to the Fukushima accident. <laughs> so overall, there are non-trivial planned reductions in nuclear power. But of course, there's a tremendous amount of growth going on at the same time. Um, and uh, we should also keep in mind that these, these pledges to phase out nuclear power, you don't just turn it off overnight in most cases. Uh, usually, the, in the case of Germany and Belgium, it's 10 to 20 years. Japan's talking about 40 years. These things, we've already seen them be put on hold. So it's entirely possible those decisions can be put on hold or even reversed in the future. Um, once the memories of Fukushima fade and the realities of you know, what are we going to do instead really sink in. Nonetheless, I'm pretty excited to see what uh, Germany, in particular, is, is going to be able to do to replace that kind of capacity. Um, in the U.S., the, the impact and response to the Fukushima accident has been pretty modest overall. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission immediately put together a task force 
to go gather lessons learned from the Fukushima incident and make recommendations for what to do in the U.S. in response. Um, and their findings were, were pretty reassuring. They call for some clear actions, but these are not, uh, you know, industry changing or design changing kinds of actions. The, the first finding was that there is no imminent risk and we can go ahead, continue generating nuclear power the way we are. There's no, no, no changes needed, no need to stop. At the same time, uh, they made several recommendations for enhancing safety. And not surprisingly, these focused on increasing the ability to uh, weather power outages for longer durations and more backups. Uh, and so several issues related to the spent fuel pools specifically, increasing the safety and redundancy of the, of the cooling systems, of the makeup water systems, and of the monitoring systems to make sure we know what's going on in these pools and we can fix it quickly. Um, and there were also several recommendations related to more general emergency preparedness and response. And so while these recommendations are certainly going to lead to increased safety, and, uh, they're not likely to change the face of nuclear power in any significant way in this country. And my final observation about the U.S. response to Fukushima incident is that after 35 years in this country without a new start on a nuclear power plant, um, a, a, a less than a year after the, the Fukushima accident, the second worst nuclear power plant accident in the world, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission issued new construction and operation licenses to two new power plants, nuclear power plants in, in the U.S., in Georgia. And so obviously these license applications were in gear years before this, and, and this is just the tail end happened to coincide with this. The fact that they didn't put the brakes on it and they said, okay, let's go ahead and issue them, it's hard not to interpret that as a, as a pretty strong signal that the U.S. has no intentions of scaling back nuclear power and, and that we're going to continue to um, build and grow as we, had, as we had before. So I just want to finish up to re repeat three messages. Um, no electricity source is ideal. Right? They all have strengths and weaknesses, and certainly nuclear is, is chief among those. It's hard to unequivocally condemn or endorse any one. And as a result, preferences vary from place to place and time to time, and we end up with a diverse mix of, of energy, electricity generation sources. And I think that's a good thing, um, both for, for variety to appease different people's preferences, but also uh, for flexibility. It takes a long time to build electricity infrastructure. And sometimes conditions, preferences can change a lot more quickly than the infrastructure can respond. So by already having the base infrastructure for a variety of, and the experience base, and the, and the technology base for a wide variety of electricity sources, the easier it is to shift among them as oil prices go up or whatever may happen. Those, those things can happen quite quickly and we want to be able to shift our energy production in response. Um, a second is, we appear to be at a real turning point with regards to managing spent nuclear fuel. For forever, we have just been sitting on it, uh, leaving it at, at nuclear power plant sites. The plan we had in place has imploded, sort of, sort of the one-two punch of the, of the existing policy imploding, and then the, the safety risks being uh, identified or highlighted by the Fukushima accident really leads us to the point where I think we've got to make a change. And uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission recommendations are, are probably the direction we're going to go, and, and there's still a lot of details to be worked out, but I suspect we'll see some movement in that area pretty soon in the near future. And then finally, uh, the response to the Fukushima accident has been pronounced in a few ways, but overall, you know, relatively modest and not terribly surprising. Some countries that had previously decided to abandon nuclear power sort of returned to that position. Some countries that never wanted nuclear power reaffirmed that position. Some countries have slowed growth a little. Japan uh, may be, will be, if they, if they stick with it, the biggest change for sure, um, going to no nuclear power. But in many other countries, as I said, there's been no change. Uh, and so overall, perhaps the biggest surprise is that, is that uh, as horrible as an accident like this may seem, uh, it hasn't really affected the industry that much around the world, and, and we should s expect to see nuclear power continue pretty much along the path we've seen before. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask about uh, two things not directly related to nuclear power, but to where we, should, where, should, where we should spend in order to get the energy we need. So one thing is just to spend to produce more energy. 
And then there's also um, spending in order to um, reduce the amount of energy we need. Um, so I saw a talk um, last night, a TED talk, it was talking about some of the chief scientists of, uh, uh, I don't remember the name of the, of the company, Rocky Mountain Industry, something like that, but they're, he was talking about uh, the Empire State Building and um, how they're doing this uh, uh, retrofit and uh, they're going to recoup the costs in three years um, by making it more efficient, more efficient cooling system, more efficient windows, so forth. Um, but he was basically kind of extrapolating from this that um, there's lots of opportunities to, for things that are inefficient right now in terms of their use of energy um, and that uh, market, the market will, it won't even need to be just because it's greener, but that people can save real money um, by making these things more efficient. He also talked about smart grid um, and uh, energy storage, um, either through if electric cars become a lot more common, they could be a form of storage. And then there's this guy from MIT who came up with this uh, system for storing energy uh, that is similar to how aluminum is. So anyway, this, what do you, taken all together, um, this guy's argument was that um, we actually won't need as much energy as we think based on the extrapolation, just on the growth of energy, use, ener energy usage now, um, and that maybe we won't actually need nuclear power, um, coal power by 2050 because of all these other things that are transpiring. So uh, just want to, curious for your thoughts on that. Um, I mean, well, is this all BS or is this? Uh, no, no, not, not in the least. That's all incredibly important and, and it's getting a little outside my area of expertise, but for example, the building stock, the case you raised first, there's, there's tremendous low hanging fruit there. Um, however, it's, ex it, it's not only expensive to retrofit and it's, it's oftentimes very, very slow to make these changes. And I think part of the challenge there, and I could, I'm not certain about this, is, is that it's sort of at an individual, not quite an individual user, but very, very distributed level, these decisions need to be made. And there's, as you're probably aware, state and federal agencies go to great efforts to develop programs to increase awareness, rebates, all kinds of incentives to get people to do the kinds of things you're talking about. And, and uh, the, the savings, particularly in the building stock, are, are potentially tremendous, I, I agree. But you know, I don't know enough about the numbers to sort of say what we really could realistically envision saving and what that means for power production or capacity development in the future. But absolutely, that's, a, that's an integral part of our energy policy, particularly in the state, but uh, even in the nation. Um, and, and Rand is, is now and, and in the past working on analyzing and evaluating different programs like this, both direct to consumer as well as to industry, to increase efficiency. Whether or not the cost argument really, you know, it's a funny thing because you can ask yourself, why don't I put solar panels on my roof? You know, there's a tremendous inertia against these sort of things. I don't really understand the behavioral aspects of it. Um, but I think part of it being distributed amongst so many individuals has at once great strength, but it perhaps is, a, is one of the impediments too. Again, I'm not really certain about the numbers. So you only talked about conventional nuclear. Maybe are we going to be saved by maybe new technologies in nuclear? Well, you know, I didn't, I didn't talk about that. It's a good point. And I, I, frankly, I don't know a tremendous amount the new, about the new nuclear technologies. Um, they're always getting new. Every new generation is much, much safer um, and, you know, to some extent more efficient. Um, for example, the new, new reactors going up in Georgia are going to have an uh, inherent safety system on the cooling pools that supposedly you won't need active cooling. They'll, they'll, they'll be designed in such a way that passive cooling will keep the spent fuel cool enough or keep the water from evaporating. Things like that are happening all the time. What this means, you know, we hear a lot about a bunch of experimental nuclear reactor types, and there's been a tremendous amount of research, and there will continue to be in the Department of Energy. Um, whether and how that changes the fundamental question of how much nuclear versus other sources, 
uh, I'm not sure about. I think there's some sort of more global view of nuclear that's sort of regardless of the particular technology. So you talked about a plan to uh, centralize where they're going to store the nuclear waste. Um, are there any security risks surrounding that, like terrorism, for example? Um, that's a very valid question. I think the consensus we came to is that it's not particularly better or worse than having it distributed around at, at different locations around the country. You know, there are advantages to centralizing the security force and building it the best way possible once or maybe twice, you know, one or two of these places so you can, con you know, concentrate more effort on it. Um, I think some of these plants, it's a real burden keeping this stuff secure and I don't know the, the track record of how well it's done. So I don't think there's, you know, our conclusion was there's not a big difference. It's, it's, it's in the wash. You mentioned our two nearby uh, reactor locations, north and south of here. Um, both in terms of the public reaction and the way the plants are managed, they seem very different. Obviously, they're currently operated by the same company, but uh, the designs are very different. Uh, one of the things that recently down in San Onofre they've mentioned is surprising about the, uh, the damage on the tubing. Are there any other plants that um, inherited the same design assumptions that, uh, um, you know, elsewhere in the U.S. that uh, might inherit excitement coming out of San Onofre? Because presumably the fact that nobody's talking about it for Diablo mean, implies that the Diablo designs aren't affected by the unexpected findings. You know, that's a great question. I haven't heard anything, and I don't know enough about the designs of the plants around the country to answer that. I think there are, there are many different designs out there, and, and they're individually tailored for the site. Uh, the seismic risk here in, in the west, west coast of California is different than other places. So uh, my suspicion is that there are a tremendous wide range of designs out there, and I just don't know about which might be closely linked to San Onofre's. One of the things that I was surprised at is just how fast Japan ramped down their um, online nuclear generation recently. Um, has, have you seen whether they've got enough capacity to make it through the next year without effectively having to take brownouts? Uh, how's it looking? I don't know. That's a, another great question. This is now what? It's, it's May. It's getting hot. And yeah. you, you all may remember last summer, uh, anyone in Tokyo didn't, wasn't allowed to wear a tie. They had no jackets. They had no lights. And they had all these uh, essentially sort of austerity, temperature austerity policies. And, uh, they made it, but it was a struggle. And I think they had some nuclear running last summer, a fair amount. So I, I would love to look into that. I haven't had a chance to go sort of talk to my colleagues and, and look in the newspaper articles about what those, what those plans are. But I imagine it's going to be very tough. Because unlike Germany, which you know, they can kind of just effectively run wires from their neighbors, in a, in a sense, use the coal from somewhere else. Japan can't really do that. They're an island, and a set of islands, and, and without those nuclear power plants, I'm not sure how they're going to make ends meet. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here.